Thank you very much, Victoria, for the kind introduction and the invitation. A pleasure to be with all of you here today. Good morning to our in-person audience, and good afternoon, good evening to our virtual audience from wherever you're watching. Uh, this morning, uh, Nick Powers and I are going to tag team to explain how we arrived at this innovative solution and walk you through our journey so far, which has been a very <clears throat> compact journey, a lot of a lot accomplished in so little time, but I will tell you this, a lot of it was driven by everything we've all gone through the last couple of years. And for those of you who know anything about supply chain, you know, even before the pandemic, it was very complex. In fact, I, I like to tell the story that when I first joined the industry, a good friend of mine told me, oh, you're gonna be fine in the port because it's not rocket science. Six months later, I talked to the same friend after having spent six months at the port trying to understand and unravel the supply chain, I called the same friend back and I said, you know, you were absolutely right. It's not rocket science, it's even more complex. And I think all of us have heard that and have seen people talk about the complexities in the supply chain. So today we're gonna to talk about how to tackle supply chain issues efficiently with data sharing. And I wanna emphasize data sharing the ability to liberate the data and ensure that the seamless transfer of data from mode to mode, sector to sector, industry to industry, will get us to the efficiency we need in the supply chain. Let me begin with the supply chain that these days is not as invisible as we once thought. Before the pandemic and before the disruption that we all went through the last couple of years, the supply chain was invisible. No one really thought about it, no one talked about it. Folks would just go to the store, they would buy a product off the shelf that said made in Taiwan or made in Korea, and they would not think about how that product got there from the origin, from the country of origin. Well, today, the supply chain is part of our everyday vocabulary. I think all of us have been affected in one way or another. We've talked about it over Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, you've gone to uh, stores to buy an appliance and they tell you that you can put down the deposit or pay for it in full, but you're gonna to have to wait six to nine months before it arrives. You go to an auto dealership and they'll tell you, you're gonna to have to pay above MSRP and you're gonna to have to wait a few more months before you get your car. We've all been affected by supply chain. And this is why we're so interested and we're so motivated to introducing this solution that we think is gonna be groundbreaking and it will revolutionize the supply chain as we know it. So here's some headlines that all of you have seen. Uh, last year in the fall, uh, even the Vice President of the United States was encouraging US consumers to buy their Christmas presents early, just to avoid any delays. The headlines were like this, order your Christmas presents now, supply delays are here to stay. We've all seen images like this, walk into a store with bare shelves, and consumers like you and I who shifted as a result of the health orders in response to the pandemic from spending our disposable income on services and entertainment to goods, we were used to seeing shelves like this. And as I mentioned a moment ago, auto dealerships look bare like this. Some of them look even bare than this right now. All of us are aware of the, of the shortage of chips that are a, an essential component of manufacturing these automobiles. Again, supply chain delays, disruption across the global supply chain. Folks really don't realize and understand how intertwined and interconnected the entire supply chain is. It's amazing to think that just to get a car manufactured and bring it here fully assembled to the United States, it has to crisscross at least a dozen different countries, utilizing parts and components from even more countries. We are a globalized economy, and the supply chain is basically uh, the manifestation of that globalization. So what happened, and what brought us to this point? As Victoria said in the beginning, the Port of Long Beach, we've been busy throughout our history. We currently rank as the second largest and second busiest seaport in North America. Last year and the year before, we set new records for containerized uh, cargo volumes. A lot of that driven by the pandemic. And here's really what happened. Two forces at work, both induced by the pandemic. On the one hand, you had a shift in consumer spending that drove demand for goods 
manufactured overseas to record highs. We were at home. We weren't being able to go out and eat and go to ball games and go to concerts, go to the gyms. So we were spending all of our disposable income buying stuff. And we were buying a lot of it, mostly online. On the other hand, also impacted by the pandemic, was tightened capacity. Every sector, every industry up and down the supply chain was impacted from a capacity standpoint. Worker shortages, equipment shortages, hours were tightened, hours were, were reduced. And so you have record demand and record volumes trying to be processed and these containers were trying to make their way through the supply chain all at the same time that capacity was impacted. When the problem started showing itself in, in severe ways in the form of uh, deterioration in services, the administration quickly uh, jumped in. And since last year, with the help of the administration, the help of the Port Envoy, the White House, and many different agencies, we've convened meetings with all of our stakeholders. And our response to the supply chain crisis has been uh, an all hands on deck approach. And you'll see here on the, some of the headlines that the administration, President Biden himself, announced measures at, at the ports and some of the things that we've done to try to get us out of this congestion. One of the first major things we did is we repurposed every square foot of vacant land inside the Port of Long Beach. Now, in the Port of Long Beach, there are 3,000 acres. And you would think that that would be enough to process the amount of cargo volumes that we handled last year. The short answer, it wasn't. And what we started seeing on port terminals is containers piling up. Now, why were the containers piling up in the port terminals? Because the warehouses were full. The distribution centers were full. There are 2 billion square feet of warehouse and distribution center space within 60, 70 miles of the port complex in Southern California. You would think that 2 billion square feet of warehouse space would be enough. The short answer is it wasn't. And that's the same reason why you had ships that were at anchor. It peaked at 109 ships. Think of this, 109 ships at one point were waiting off the shores of our port complex just to get in. So in effect, what you had is the shortage of warehouse and distribution center capacity was converting our port terminals into warehouses, converting the ships into warehouses and even converting chassis. How many of you are familiar with what a chassis is? It's a vital piece of equipment that's used to haul a container via truck. Even chassis were serving as warehouses. So this is what led us to this point. Right now, we have over 140 acres of vacant land that we are currently uh, utilizing for short-term container storage. This is all in an effort to provide immediate relief to our terminals and make sure that boxes get off the ship and make their way through the terminal and get those boxes with the products that they contain to the ultimate destination. I would also add that one of our key capital infrastructure projects that was delivered just last year, that also delivered an additional 1 million TU throughput capacity. So between the 140 acres plus completion of the final phase of our Long Beach container terminal project, we've added a lot of necessary capacity. The second major thing we did is we expanded hours of operation. In the absence of physical capacity, we thought that the best way we could help is by expanding hours of operation, making sure that the port terminals were opening up earlier, they were closing later, they were open on weekends, and all in an effort, again, to get those boxes off those ships, bring those ships at anchor to berth, and keep the supply chain moving. And I will say this as well, even at the height of the pandemic, we never closed because we understood from day one how vital our port was to the national economy. The number of jobs that we generate, the number of containers that we move, containers that cross our docks on a day-to-day -day basis reaches all 435 congressional districts. That's how important this is. So we take it seriously for that reason. So what we did is we opened up our terminals 24 hours a day four days a week. We started with one terminal. Today, there are two terminals that are open 24 hours a day. Every other terminal in the Southern California port complex are opening earlier, they're closing later, they're open on weekends. And then of course, the third thing we did, utilizing every tool at our disposal, is we used our tariff. 
and we announced a fee to try to encourage and incentivize the prompt evacuation of what we call long-dwelling containers. You know, one of the interesting things about responding to a crisis is you get to come up with these fancy terms, right? A long-dwelling container is a container that sits in a port terminal longer than adequate. We define that today as nine days or longer. And some of you are saying, well, what's normal? Well, before the pandemic and before the supply chain disruption, containers on average spend anywhere from three to five days on the terminal. Today, they're spending as long as nine, 10 plus days on terminal. What we need to do is move those containers out. And don't forget that it's not just about containers that are making their way into the United States and the US markets. It's also about containers that are making their way back out to Asia. So we've got this crisscross of inbound and outbound containers and our terminals have that delicate assignment of making sure that there's, there is a seamless transfer of containers on the inbound and outbound side. So this fee basically was intended to assess, uh, be assessed on the shipping lines and those containers that were on terminal nine plus days. And I have some good news. It's been so successful, we haven't had to collect the fee. In fact, we keep deferring the fee week after week after week because the industry came together, our shipping lines, the shippers, the railroads, the trucking companies, the chassis leasing companies, they all came together and they found a way to move these long dwelling containers out. So I say all of this as background to underscore that during the, our response to the supply chain disruption, not only was the lack of capacity glaring, perhaps even more glaring than that, was a lack of visibility the lack of information sharing, the lack of data sharing. And friends, let me tell you, this was something that was already in existence long before the pandemic. If anything, what the pandemic and the disruptions that ensued in the supply chain did is it heightened, it exposed, it exacerbated a lot of these legacy issues that those of us who know anything about supply chain were keenly aware of even before the pandemic. So what we did, even before COVID hit, is we partnered with AWS and they guided us through this process they call working backwards, trying to understand what the customer really wants and what the customer really needs. Now, as a customer, as a consumer speaking for myself, I don't always know what I want or what I need. I'm influenced by commercials, I'm influenced by marketing, I'm influenced by what I think I need, but when it comes down to the basics, I need some help. So AWS came and they helped us. They helped us through their process define the needs of the customer to better understand how we could help them. Now, over the last 10 years, there have been a lot of advancements in our industry in the form of technology. I have a line that I like to use. Technology is a tool. It's not a solution until that tool is properly integrated into the operation. I would like to say that there are a lot of tools out there, but none of them go as far as to be able to help our customers, our shippers, answer this very fundamental question. Where is my cargo? Where is my cargo? How many of you flew to get here? Okay. Isn't it great to know that, to know exactly when your flight's gonna take off, your ETA for arrival? If there's a delay, we get a text message or you get an email. Isn't it great to have that visibility? Isn't it great to know that if there's a change in your itinerary, someone will let you know ahead of time so that you don't have to arrive to the airport and find out there, minutes before your flight leaves, that your flight was canceled? As passengers, we desire that visibility. Wouldn't it be great if we had a similar level of visibility in the supply chain? Where the shipper could know on any given day when their container will arrive, when that container is going to be discharged from that ship, when the train that's going to take that container into the interior of the United States is going to depart the terminal, when that trucking company can go to pick up that container. Friends, unfortunately, that doesn't exist today. But I'm convinced that with this process that we went through, understanding the needs of our customer, 
understanding the different connection points between the different modes, tracking the voyage of the container from origin to destination, by bringing everyone together in the supply chain, I believe we have the answer. And that's what we're gonna be presenting you today. We call it the Supply Chain Information Highway. Now, why would, he, why, why, why would we call it a highway? We call it a highway because this is not just another cargo visibility tool. There are several that exist in the market. If you think of those as cars that carry data, what we're building is a highway that will enable all these different cars and their data to travel on this common corridor so that we can ensure there's, there's true end-to-end -end visibility across modes, and eventually, it'll be coast to coast. We launched this just last December. And so far, the Port of Oakland, the Northwest Seaport Alliance, which comprises the ports of Seattle and Tacoma, and even the Utah Inland Port Authority have joined us. They're gonna be working with us to develop this, this concept into a true end-to-end -end solution. And we're talking, we're talking with other port authorities as well to make sure that this highway is truly end-to-end, -end, coast to coast. Think of the highway as that common corridor that brings all the data points together and each of these ports that join us over time is on ramps to this highway. And you know what? Another feature that you'll hear in a moment by Nick that lowered some of the friction as well, that helped us bring everyone together, is the price. What's your favorite price? Free. In fact, I should have called this the supply chain information freeway because we're not in the business of monetizing data. Uh, we believe that as a port authority, this should be part of that service that we offer to you. Just like the airlines don't charge you, to get the pings about the status of your flight. So ladies and gentlemen, there's, there are a lot of neat features that Nick will talk about. And we're so grateful for, to AWS for working with us, partnering with us to help us develop the concept to better define the needs of the customer so that we can help them answer this very basic and fundamental question, where is my cargo? To tell you more about the information highway, I'm gonna introduce our partner, from Uncommon. Uh, Nick Powers is the Chief Operating Officer of Uncommon, and he'll tell you more about where we are, what this does, and the value it delivers. Nick. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> so as Noel mentioned, um, this has been a really exciting project to work on, and we were very honored that AWS reached out to us and said, hey, there's, a, there's an opportunity here in California to really make an impact on uh, the national scene. And when I started looking up what the Port of Long Beach does on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, one in every five containers that you see on the road in the United States today comes through the Port of Long Beach. I mean, that's an unbelievable thing to think about is I'm driving down the highway, I'll see five, six trucks, you know, very easily in a mile. And to think probably one of those trucks came from the Port of Long Beach, one of those containers came from the Port of Long Beach is incredible. And so, you know, we were brought in because we actually have been doing work with the Department of Defense for the last 12 years. And in that space, we've been actually helping global logistics for the military uh, under the United States Transportation Command. And so we have a lot of experience in tying data together, working with all these different providers that, that really work through the Port of Long Beach. And so this was a really great fit for both Uncommon and the Port. And so when we talk about the Supply Chain Information Highway, I think one of the best things that demonstrates a, a, a little look in, in the life of the port is, is this short little video that CNN did last fall, which is just demonstrating all of the, the traffic that comes in and out of the port. And this is you know, essentially a week's worth of data. Um, ships coming in and out, transiting, going to anchor, um, moving into port to unload. It's, it's incredible all the things that are going on in a, in a given day. And so when you look at what happens within the port, once that ship actually uh, makes it to the terminal, you have all of this data that's being created. And this is just a very, very small subset of data. But what it demonstrates is between the different industries that serve our supply chain, there's a distinct difference between the types of data being created. And so, for instance, if you're a, 
uh, ocean carrier, you're creating EDI 300 events, and you're you're reporting on the status of the cargo, you're reporting on your 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 status of your vessel, where it is, when it's going to make a port call. Um, once it gets to the terminal, another um, organization takes control, and that are our terminal operators that are assisted by our organized labor um, unions, such as the ILWU of Southern California. Um, and those folks go to work day and night. So when we talk about 24 by 7, it's really a, a bigger, not only a big impact on our truck drivers, but a big impact on our terminal operators. And so they're responsible for operating the cranes, moving those containers on and off the ship, moving them on and off the rail, on and off trucks, moving them in and out of our yards. And so they have data that they generate as well. And then we get them onto a train, right? Um, we've all seen the big trains, Union Pacific, BNSF, um, tremendous assets uh, to move our cargo throughout our country. Well, those train providers, those carriers of, of uh, the, the cargo also create uh, transactions. They create their own 200 series uh, data transactions and, and things like that, 400 series. And so what we have here is as we go left to right, we have all this different kind of data. It's all in different formats. It's all in different, each, each depending on who you are, different information is important to you and not important to you. And so that kind of outlines the problem that we're trying to solve here, which is how do we take all of that data that's being created by all of these different modes of transportation and boil it down to what Noel said was, where is my cargo? Um, and so what we focused on in this proof of concept is how do we get that data and we turn it into a container event? Um, that container event would essentially tell you you know, this, this container has been at this location on this date and time, and I might be able to even give you a little bit of visibility of where it's going next. But if you just boiled it down to that thing, that's very valuable to all these modes of transportation. It's incredibly valuable. Um, because as you can see on the left side, they spend an inordinate amount of time trying to gather all of this data from all these different people. They have people working day and night to translate that data into a feed that they can use in their own systems. Um, I didn't even mention the fact that they're probably logging into 30 to 40 different websites at a time. Um, they're creating API connections that maybe in the, in the hundreds of transactions or a hundred of connections in a, in a daily or weekly basis. So there's a lot of what I call data friction um, that is built up across the industries over the years. And so what we've built is a data sharing environment, a data platform, a place to house, translate, reduce the data friction to the lowest amount that we can possibly lower it to, and provide that data back out to all those transportation providers. So those stakeholders in the port ecosystem are going to be given data back out for free. They're gonna be, giving, uh, be able to ingest that data into their systems, into their planning, their optimizing, their scheduling systems, and be able to use that to better plan, optimize, and schedule. You know, Noel mentioned earlier, we're not trying to necessarily solve specific instances of, 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 uh, of problems. There's a, there's a whole bunch of problems that have built up over time. And if you tried to solve for all those problems, you're never gonna get it done. But what we can do is liberate the data across our supply chain and allow people to solve those problems faster, better, and do it in their own ways. We're not trying to dictate to trucking companies how to solve their trucking issues or ocean carriers how to solve their issues. But if we can give them the data they need, they can do that on their own. So how are we getting data in the system? As I mentioned earlier, this is a phase one prototype. So we're actually wrapping it up today. And so as part of that prototype, we identified one of the key terminals inside of the Port of Long Beach, um, LBCT. It's, it's one of the most advanced container terminals in the United States. And as Noel mentioned earlier, um, the final phase of that project was completed in summer of 2021. And so it's an incredible feat to behold. Uh, I've actually had the, the uh, occasion to be able to go out to the port and be able to see it firsthand, and it's, it's just a marvel of engineering. Um, but the interesting thing about it while I was there, it was hardly even moving. And the reason why it was hardly even moving was there was nowhere to put any of the containers. And so we actually had two gigantic ocean carriers sitting there full of containers that couldn't do anything. It was incredible. And so what we do, we have to liberate this data. We have to make it better. So data getting into the system, we, we work with the terminal operator LBCT. We work with the ocean carriers that call to that port. 
We work with um, the train, the rail, and some of the truck drivers and some of our beneficial cargo owners. So we identified a subset of, of uh, essentially partners for the prototype. We are piping that data in in the format that they choose. So we're not dictating you have to pipe it in in this specific EDI transaction or this specific JSON or whatever it is. We're actually allowing them to send the data to us like they would send it to anybody else. And that's a very, very key point here. Anytime you start laying down standards on people overnight, there's a lot of, re you know, there's a, a lot of pushback. And so we didn't want that. Um, we want, this is a free solution, so we have to make it uh, free, freely able to be used. And so as a result of that, we're bringing all these transactions in in their formats. So 300 series, 200 series, 400 series, flat files, CSVs, we're connecting to APIs. Whatever they need us to do, we're going and getting that data and bringing it in to our AWS environment. Once that's in the environment, we actually go through a scrubbing process and remove any data that is sensitive in nature. Um, for the most part, the carriers typically do that ahead of time when they send that data to us, but we really want to make sure that there's no data in the system that could be considered sensitive in nature. And I think another key point here is this data is incredibly valuable to all of the transportation providers operating in the system. And so it's imperative on us as now the protectors of their data that they've given us is to make sure only the people that should see the different parts of the data see the right amounts of data. And so we go through this whole scrubbing curation process where we, we make sure that the data is put in and indexed in a way that only people that should touch and see that container as it travels through the port get access to that data. We don't just give access to all data to everybody. Um, in fact, I don't think anybody would have signed up if that was the plan. And so as a result of the security and the data controls that we put in place, people are a little bit more comfortable with coming in and bringing their data to share. So that data is being pumped into the environment, and then we provide it back out through a very standard industry normal REST API. So a RESTful web service, those, all those uh, transportation providers and beneficial cargo owners that are part of our ecosystem are given accounts, uh, secure keys that allow them to connect to that API bridge, and then they can pull the data out of the system related to the cargo that they're managing. So it's, it's very simple, it's, it's straightforward, and that's really the point of this, right, is once again, I'm lowering friction, lowering access to data, um, and then I think another key part of this too is, and something I was challenged very early on by Noel was, Nick, not everybody has all of the technology in the world to be able to process these transactions and look at this data. How can we make this accessible to even our mom and pop small businesses, you know, trucking companies and things like that? And so what you'll see is our, um, you can call that API through a web browser, you know, with the right authentication. And you can pull that data into, say, an Excel spreadsheet, and we've made it all human readable. So our key value pairs are very easy to discern, very easy to read, very easy to get information out of. And so we've had people take that into an Excel spreadsheet and turn it into a pivot table or whatever they need to be able to get the information out of it that they need. So, so it's, this is not just a high-tech solution. This is a solution that can be used by um, you know, large businesses down to very small businesses. And I think that's very important. Um, and it's, it's a very um, key initiative for the port as well. That was, a, that was something they challenged us very early on with. So, you know, what we're trying to do is get to this answer, essentially. I've got source data on the left. You know, this is the transaction type it came out of. Um, I've got some kind of description of an event that occurred. The container was unloaded. It was loaded. It was put on a rail. It was taken off a rail. Um, a date that it occurred. You know, it's very important, the timing of all these things. These, these transactions go into um, resource planning systems, like I said, scheduling systems. And as a result of that, these times matter because they actually build in averages and predictions and they try to organize and schedule their warehouses, they organize and schedule their stores. And so it's very important that they understand the timing of all these things because that all goes into their system and it impacts their entire logistics, sales, and distribution system. And essentially a location, you know, where did it happen? And this is important because we're not just only thinking about Long Beach. You know, as Noel mentioned, we're thinking about multiple ports in multiple locations across the United States. 
And so these transactions can feed into those inland ports like the Port of Utah and inform them about trucks coming, rail coming, things like that, so they can prepare their equipment ahead of time and be able to unload that cargo from those, those transportation systems. So, you know, when we talk about the benefits of this system, it's really important to remember that we are the data platform. That's really what we want to be is the platform. The highway, as Noel mentioned, the foundation of how we can plan, schedule, and optimize. But we don't want to solve those planning, scheduling, and optimizing things. They've already spent tons of money. There's industries built around these types of systems. We understand that, and we don't want to compete with that, and we're, we don't want to monetize that. And so as a result of that, you know, we've stayed at that foundational level. We believe this, these, this, this data can actually make a profound impact on enterprise resource planning systems as well. And we also see this as, you know, when I talk about friction, as friction gets higher, that's not just timing. That's not like, that's not just access. That's actually also increasing cost. So the more friction that exists, the more cost that all of our transportation providers in the system have to bear in order to do business. And so we see this as lowering lots of costs for them. Less API connections, less websites to go to, less people to have to curate and translate this data on a daily basis. And so we're trying to free up capability so they can focus that, those resources on other things such as optimizing the supply chain, coordinating schedules better and things like that. You know, we also see this as opening the door for a lot of different transportation providers. Um, as Noel said earlier today, you know, we talked about all the things that go into me just flying here, you flying here, and getting visibility into what's going on with an airplane. You know, if you check a bag, making sure that bag gets on the right plane, making sure it gets, you know, unloaded correctly, all those types of things. Well, it's, it's, it's crazy to think, but there are a lot of transportation providers today that are just sitting there by the phone, essentially, and waiting for someone to call them and tell them to do something and they're reacting. And what we really need people to be able to do is think strategically. What am I doing next week? What am I doing the week after that? How do I coordinate? I've only got 10 trucks. How do I make the most out of the 10 trucks today? Because if they can make the most out of what they have, especially from an equipment perspective and the equipment shortages that we're experiencing today, they're gonna maximize the value of their companies, they're gonna maximize their productivity, and they're gonna be able to hire people, pay people more, and so this is just, it just continues to proliferate benefits for the entire country. So as I mentioned earlier, Uncommon has a background in Department of Defense. And I think this was, not only was our ex expertise in logistics and especially the data very important to the Port of Long Beach, but the security of this data was also paramount. You know, I talked about the critical nature of the competitive data that's being stored in this system. So, um, we cannot afford to have it be hacked. We cannot afford to have a data leak. We cannot afford to have an accident. Um, the moment we have an accident is the moment that everybody picks up their data and goes home, and we don't want that. And so Uncommon has applied several AWS best practices, such as leveraging serverless technology as much as possible, which reduces our fingers on the keyboards and allows us to essentially inherit significant security postures like patching and other types of management. Um, it also allows us to scale the environment very quickly and very easily. Um, and so those types of practices have been key. We've also, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we've implemented an identity and access management solution that not only brokers the handshake to allow you into the environment to get to the data, but it actually is an integrated into the data itself. So the roles, um, and the types of attribute information that we, we apply from a security perspective is tied to the data. Uh, we tag it as it's being brought into the uh, environment, and that is used to make sure that we give the right data to the right people at the right times. So what is it, what is, this is a very simple diagram, but that's the, thing, that's, the, that's the beauty of this entire project is we have a very complicated thing we're trying to solve for. But at the end of the day, the most complicated things can be solved by the most simplistic solutions. And so what we have today is, is an example of what our environment looks like. We have our transportation provider partners on the left. These are representative of 
of the types of, of transportation providers we work with at the Port of Long Beach. And they're, they're funneling data in multiple formats to us through a secure connection into an AWS environment. We process that data using S3 buckets and lambdas, and we actually leverage a service called Elasticsearch. And that allows us to build our index, which as, once again, as those providers, those BCOs are coming from the right, they're able to then hit our API gateway and get the data out of the system. Pretty simple. Pretty easy, right? <laughs> so essentially, that's, that's the long and the short of where we're at. We have a prototype that we've stood up. We have transportation providers participating and sharing data with us today. We have shipping partners that we're sending data to and allowing them to have limited access to the environment. We're getting ready to go into a phase two, and that should start here in the next 30 to 60 days. And with the phase two, we'll be opening up all of the terminals at the Port of Long Beach, so another additional five or six terminals will be coming online, and we'll be talking to an additional, say, upwards of 20 to 30 ocean carriers and uh, bringing that data online. And you know, I'll hand it back to Noel for some closing comments. Thank you, Nick. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, uh, what we're developing in partnership with Uncommon AWS is something that is truly groundbreaking. Uh, there are solutions out there, there are tools out there, but nothing to this extent. And again, our vision ultimately is not just end-to-end -end across the supply chain, but coast-to-coast. -coast. Keep in mind that the supply chain is a system of systems. One of the reasons why information doesn't flow so seamlessly is because it's a series of silos. We're trying to break those silos. We're trying to, as Nick said, bring down the friction so that the data is liberated. And by the way, every year, the Port of Long Beach serves 200,000 different companies, 200,000 different shippers. And yes, many of them are your big box retailers, your big shippers that have the resources, have the systems in place to be able to connect but we also serve shippers that only route one, two, three, four containers a year. What this does is it has incredible flexibility so that every shipper, regardless of their size, regardless of access to resources, can access the data they need so that they can then optimize their own operations. So what we're doing here is different, it's innovative, it's groundbreaking. We're excited about what this could do for the broader supply chain. And again, we thank you for your interest and we'd be more than happy to take any questions at this time or following today's session. And again, thank you very much, AWS, for the opportunity, for your partnership. Um, let's, let's go save Christmas this year and, and get out of these supply chain snarls. Thank you very much. Nice job. Okay. Great job. I think we have a few minutes. If anyone has any questions, we'll be happy to take. We have one over here. Yes, sir. There we go. I think there's a microphone that's coming your way. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was uh, very insightful. I have a question about you. You said that your main goal was to be the data highway, and you had your own methods of authenticating uh, your your users. In this case, the actual transportation companies themselves. But you also mentioned. Uh, in the context of a flight, for example, maybe someone who's shipping the cargo might want to have, and I think you spoke on this a little bit, access to that data. Are you leaving that to the transportation companies, or are you going to have uh, a, for example, like a shipper have their own methods of access? Do you have plans for that? Uh, thank you. Yeah, so the BCOs or the shippers are a key part of this equation. Um, in fact, they're really the start of this entire process, right? How do we give them visibility? How do we allow them to plan and, and schedule correctly? So one of the companies we're working with is Bella Canvas. Um, and to me, it wasn't a familiar name, but one of the interesting things that they actually do, which is, I just, you just don't think about all the, the complexities of a clothing supply chain, but they actually work with the Kardashian lines of, of clothing. And so one of the things they told us right out of the gate was, look, Nick, you know, the way the supply chain is working today, we have to put orders in almost 12 months ahead of time. And it's really hard to predict what people want 12 months ahead of time, a year ahead of time. I'm going to know what kind of shirt you want to wear, what kind of pants you want to wear. And the reason for that is if they don't do that, 
the delays that we're seeing, you know, bringing cargo, you know, from various different places in the, United, in the world into the Port of Long Beach so they can, you know, get the, that clothing inside of a department store is, in, is they're actually, you know, two to three months late right now if they don't get those orders in early. And so, you know, th that was a key use case right out of the gate was how do we help Bella Canvas get visibility in the supply chain you know, and I talked about the ERP, the, the scheduling systems, the planning systems, as they aggregate data over time, they'll be able to start understanding, okay, it's taking an average amount, this much time to get from here to here, here to here, here to here, and then they can better coordinate the movements of their trucks, the movements of their distribution centers, um, in order to make sure that they're catching the movements of this cargo as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible, and moving it to the next person because that gets their clothing into the department stores and they can make sales. And if they can't do that, then the, what's the point of even doing business, right? So the shippers, the BCOs are a huge part of, of what this project's about, for sure, absolutely. You know, I, I would also add to that, Nick, that when, when you talk about efficiency, obviously the focus is on the operation, the transfer, the handoffs, if you will, between modes, you know, ship, terminal, train, truck, chassis, the reality is for the shipper, our ultimate customer, efficiency translates into money and profitability. Uh, I can't tell you how many times we hear from shippers saying, our warehouses are full, but they're full of the wrong stuff. Uh, there are some retailers that still have Christmas gifts in their warehouses today. And the, the lack of reliability, the lack of predictability is really glaring. And, and what we're hoping to accomplish with the supply chain information highway is bring that visibility and make it accessible to everyone, regardless of their size or scale and, and what access to resources they have. The other point to note is a supply chain, it, it's, it's, it's really a, a system of systems. Each mode is trying to optimize their own business operations without consulting or consideration of the next. So what you have is you have this misalignment up and down the supply chain. Most entities that have custodial control over their own supply chains, they don't need something like this because they have their own. They control all the assets up and down the supply chain. When you're dealing with a public supply chain like this, it's about bringing the different partners together and saying, hey, if you want your operation to be more successful, you got to be willing to share your data. And, and that's what we're trying to do here, is, is trying to bring, break away all these silos, bring the entire supply chain together so that the data um, can be accessible by all. So I'll build on to that a little bit too, Noel. Mm -hmm. So we met with a, um, a consortium, so to speak, of uh, truck drivers in, in California called PeerPass. PeerPass's number one goal is to coordinate um, and represent the, ship, or the trucking community of Southern California as it moves cargo for all these different distribution providers and whatnot. And so one of the things that's interesting is, you know, the Port of Long Beach is a, a, a landowner, right? They don't actually operate their port. The terminals are leased out and those terminals can decide how they want to operate their own operations. The port can just try their best to help out in any way they can. And that's, that's, that's why we're doing the supply chain information highway. But back to PeerPass, so one of the things they told me was, Nick, do you realize across the Port of LA and the Port of Long Beach, there are 18 different scheduling systems. And so I'm a mom and pop, I've got five trucks, and I wanna, I wanna move as much cargo in and out of the Port of LA and Long Beach. How do I navigate 18 different systems? How do I ensure that my five trucks are doing everything at any time and they're not sitting by idly waiting for a job so we can actually make money. You know, truck drivers don't make money unless they're moving. And so that's an incredible problem, right? And so you start thinking about 18 different scheduling systems just in two ports. And yes, those two ports make up one of the biggest port in systems in the, in the entire world. But still at the same time, that's a really hard problem to navigate. And so when you start thinking about breaking down these, these data friction points, sharing that data with these mom and pops, sharing this data with all of the different transportation providers, they're gonna be able to go, hey, I know where I can go with my trucks at the right time at the right place to be able to make sure I optimize my business and make sure my truck drivers are making money. And so that's just another example of the complexities that we're trying to break down with the system. Just give everybody access to the, the really the nuts and bolts data so they can do their jobs. Fantastic.